absolutely beautiful. Communicates with incredible ease a, a life with many stories and episodes in it. And I'm, as I was watching it, of course, what, it, what dawned on me that, in fact, me one thing that holds together all of the different parts of your life is, in fact, the image of architecture. Architectural imagery, in, in a way, runs between the archive the great masters that you work with, someone like Mises' un understanding of the photographic image in architecture as an extension of his work, and in a way the naturalness of the film seems to be that we're now seeing a life we've understood through other kinds of images, or architecture itself, in the kind of images that film makes possible. And I'm wondering if, if, the, if the medium itself was a conversation between the two of you, if the, if the idea of making a film as a different kind of architectural image is something that you thought about in terms of all the other kinds of images that have literally filled your life, your collection, and, and, well, and I'm, I'm thinking... I'm going to begin to think about it, but <laughs> I have to say that I hadn't thought about it in those terms, and we never really discussed, we never really discussed that. Um, At all, yeah. But uh, it's interesting that you would, you would, you would see that. Um, it would just add another layer to the film because the film is about layers, yeah. as you can see. And um, and um, I was most interested in showing the complexity of this personnage, which was Phyllis Lambert, and yet not getting into a heavy mm -hmm. kind of docu, you know, the documentaries that we were all trying to get away from. Um, what was really important. Um, is the way the, that I tried to use uh, newspapers, and uh, a lot of them were fake, because when we were missing a narration, I would just have a newspaper made. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, special effects man, his name was John Tate, <laughs> and uh, he, he made a lot of those huh. newspapers, but, but Phyllis has a fantastic uh, archive at the CCA, and she's very much covered by the press, as yeah. we, can, we can even we learned here in, right here in your office, she was apparently interviewed and, and she's very good at that. So Phyllis, what do you have to say now that you've seen the film yeah. several times? Well, <coughs> I haven't seen it for quite a while. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure that I know the person who was there. <laughs> Somebody said, you know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's sort of detached from me, really. I mean, the, the fun we had doing it, mm. but, um, you know, it's, it's something else out there. So if we were, to, we were to make the film now, which is two, the, two years later, what else would you add? Well, it's not that I would add anything to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a, an entity in itself. You said you'd wished that <coughs> there was more about the CCA, and I think that's a whole other yeah. issue. And uh, uh, I suppose, I, I think that, you know, for me, what has been most important is like the building in the city. And so there's the Seagram building, which is very definitely that. And well it's not the Seagram building, Seagram Plaza and Tower. You know, I have to break that, that building, building, building. It's not a building. It's, it, it's a kind of a, a, an oasis, a whole spirit in the city. And that's a, that's a big difference. Mm. And so people are always talking about buildings as objects. And I, I think nobody wants to really be dealing with that. And um, I, I thought you would say that you're now as you say in the film, that you're no longer an, you're no longer a practicing architect, and you're no longer an artist, which you were as a child, but you're a writer now, and that's very related to what you're doing today. And it's something that I wasn't able to treat really uh, in the film, but that if I were making another film on you today, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it certainly it would be about the book you're writing now, mm. and uh, I think that would be something that would be interesting for this particular public to Absolutely. hear from you. Well, it's a, bu a book on the Seagram building. Right? I thought you said really? building. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> 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 it's just sort of s terrible force of habit, I'm afraid. And it's, it, it's a kind of, it is the culture of, the, of, the, of architecture in the city. And uh, hmm. so it's a kind of the pre-project uh, before I got involved and then the so building the Ur building and then major issues that Mies was working with, basically the landscape, and because that's what it is, you know. I think I have to figure out how to 
you know, get that point across. And then there's Philip and Light. There's an old caption on, on that. So that was published uh, in, in Grey, Grey Room some time yeah. ago. And then, um, then there's a second, the third section is actually the building in the city. Building, there we go again. So um, I don't know, I'll have, to, I'll have to figure out how to deal with that. And um, it really is how the plaza changed the zoning in New York. And 61, uh, New York you know, ha has had the same zoning since 1916. That's when the first laws were made and or regu regulations. And uh, it had been obviously changed to a certain extent, but the intent was changed. And it was into uh, zoning that was asking people to do something they wanted to do, incentive zoning, mm -hmm. rather than bad, you did the wrong thing, you know. And um, so that plazas in the uh, city, throughout the city, uh, they, there was a, um, you, know, you were recompensed for that. And so all over the city, the, the New York changed overnight by 80, just everything, yeah, yeah. you know. And, and that was on the one hand, on the other hand, was Seagram uh, was, was, was given a very high um, taxation. And they started to realize they were being taxed much, much, to much greater extent than anything around. And that was because the city said, well, you know, the finance department, you have one department over here, another over there. They said, you know, the building was built for 35 million, you declare an economic value of yeah. 17,000, uh, 17 million, what goes on <coughs> here? So they said, okay, you're getting some sort of benefit out of this building. It was a very, very long case. Seagram took it all the way through the courts in New York City and New York State, to the highest court in New York State, and they lost. And because they never could explain <laughs> exactly, you know, what, what it was, I, I don't think they did made, made a very good case, really. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is that um, it became a cost to live. In 1954, <coughs> architecture was a non-subject hmm. in New York. There had already been the, um, the UN building and the Lever House building, 51, Two, 52. 52 yeah. But you know, that was just considered by the real estate people and everybody else. Museum of Modern Art to the side. It just was um, oh. you know, just another building and they didn't think of architecture. But at the point, Seagram was really kind of a pivotal point because also at that time, the, um, the, the uh, McKinley and White's uh, great steel and glass uh, um, Pennsylvania station was threatened and unfortunately it did come down. And that of course then created, uh, finally New York did the listing of, of buildings uh, yeah. in, in, in New York. So that was a kind of fascinating thing. Then, then the other thing was Seagram's as sort of a cultural place. You know, we had the plaza, we had sculpture that changed from time to time. And the plaza related to an exhibition that might be at the uh, Whitney or, or at the Guggenheim or New York Museum of Modern Art. And then, so it, it became a kind of a, it was qu quite, quite very interesting. And um, then the, uh, the, the, actually the collections in the Seagram building, the fourth floor, was a actually a gallery and it would be reported on in the New Yorker, things like that. Yeah. And so, you know, I had formed collections for the uh, for, for Seagram for the building. So, you know, what would people want to put in their offices? The early ca Varga cal calendars. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so that, that <coughs> those those were absolutely wonderful. The photograph collection, but also there was a superb collection of um, drinking vessels. And then, of course, there was the Four Seasons and uh, the Picasso and, and, and all of that. So it was a, and it, Seagram was extraordinary about it. I mean, they just, uh, I'd have to ask permission, obviously, but uh, they just sort of said, yes, let's go ahead. Hmm. And uh, it was also a very benign place. People said that, you know, that the pools on both sides of the plaza and people would stick their, there's a little tiny ledge where you go on the bench and, 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 and the pools and people put their feet in it. And there was n never anybody that was, you know, saying we can't do this or none of this obscene situation one has now with all of that terrorism sphere. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's a set 
mindset. But it was always absolutely great. And so it was a very important um, uh, cultural place. I don't like the word, the word in institution in the city. And then the last section of it is, which is the only piece I haven't written yet, and that is continuity. How do you protect this? How do you make it uh, longevity? You know, that's the same problem we have with CCA. How do mm. you make that work in the future? Mm. So those are very interesting problems. Yeah. And the question of legacy. I, y y you, you touch on it briefly in the film. You speak of the years at Yale. And I, and I can remember this quote have in, in an interview with you from a few years ago where you speak of the and I think the word you, you describe Yale as an ungenerous place, and that's yeah. part of what gets you to think about Chicago, if I'm right, in studying, uh, doing the graduate degree with, uh, I think it's Myron Goldsmith. Well, this was Myron, yes. And it, it made me think about Chicago, and I'm wondering, as you talk about architecture in the city, what the experience of Chicago was like. I mean, you, in, in a way, beyond IIT, what's interesting about it is that it's a city with a deep modern architectural history, and in fact, one that was quite a lot older than most cities in North America, yes, given, yes. given the Chicago frame at the end of the 19th century and early 20th. And if an interest in, in, in the idea of a legacy in modern architecture or modernism might first get uh, thought about there as oh, part of the experience of studying right. in Chicago. And then, of course, I also worked when I was there. You know, uh, the IIT was in a part of town which, mm. you know, Chicago had this terrible thing. After 35th Street South, everything was black. Uh, yeah. You know, after the First World War, actually, and you they had a law where, you know, you couldn't checkerboard. You, everybody in this block had to be black, and everybody it was dreadful. Yeah. And um, so that I worked on um, an area called the Gap, and uh, tried to see if we could, um, you know, how we could re uh, re rework that in, in some sort of way. I'm afraid I knocked it uh, down too many buildings. It didn't really work. You know, I worked more on a kind of uh, Helbersheimer scheme, but uh, it, was, it was the first experience I had with that. And it was at the time when there was a new city, you know, lo laws coming in uh, federally. And um, hmm. it, was, it was really very, very, very interesting. And so that, of course, prepared me for what I was doing in Montreal, as, as did, of course, my experience as an architect and developer in, in, in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, Chicago, sorry, in, in Los, An Los well, Angeles. Well, I was in our office, but you know, our office was in Los Angeles. But you know, you could learn to pro project into the future. That was a fantastic thing to say. You know, uh, we did this hotel, and so you say, okay, the rate of the rooms now is sixty-five, but dollars, you know, a night, and then in, in, in a year or two, it'll be one hundred and twenty or something like that. And you could see it happening, and and so that gave me a whole kind of other way. So there w it was the space and also the, um, you know, how, how one could work within the city. You speak about the role of photography, which obviously becomes a big part of the film itself, the use yes, of the I photographs. I it should be made clear that every photograph that, was m that, was that is made of the building, like the whole yeah. series of the Seagram's, of the uh, Sadie Bronfman Center, of slides were all Amazing, photos, yeah. and that the Mies van der Rohe portraits, which I've never seen any other portraits, uh, where I tried to show that from the drawing became the photographs, they're all Phyllis's. And, um, and in fact, the, in a way, I think I like the Greek photographs the least, but we did have a problem Irving gave, we had a problem with that. The trouble with one of my people. We had a trouble <laughs> with that, yes. We didn't, every time I see the film, I think, oh God, those very banal photographs of the Parthenon. But, yeah. but uh, yes, Phyllis is also a photographer. And also, I think you should mention the fact that we forgot to talk mm. about, uh, you could mention in Oh, mention terrible, terrible. Here. All those p photographs I took in Montreal, I took with Richard Fair. And, mm. the, and the, the four by five format, in fact, we didn't show any of my photographs. They were all his photographs. And for heaven's sakes, I mean, I, I did all the research and uh, you know decided we had to see this building at eight o'clock in the morning and this one at seven and you know and uh, you and worked on in the afternoon, yeah. but and I took my own uh, uh, you know uh, thirty-five millimeter. And those are all Richard's photographs, and of course Richard uh, has w worked with me. He was the one who formed me the collection, and there's going to be an exhibition of his work at the Royal Academy, uh, I think in eleven or twelve or something like that of the fantastic <laughs> things he did that we supported him I, uh, in, um, in Russia on the 
uh, the buildings of um, you know the twenties, in, in essence, hmm. constructed as bu buildings. So I so I feel terrible. I don't know why. I was completely mad. I just no, it was with well, anyway. Whatever. It's we. I don't even think we have in the credits. Do we? Yeah, we I do. Okay. We do. Okay. <laughs> we do. <laughs> I mean, God, <laughs> these are the kind of things that happens when you're making the film over several years, and all of a sudden, the most very important people oh. are sudden, suddenly forgotten. You don't even know how this can happen, but it's nice to be able to to be able to say so in public, so that if any of you out exactly. there, are yeah. Richard Paris friends, you'll remember that he was remembered. What was the, t the length of time you worked on the film? Pardon? W the length of time you worked on the film. How, how long? <laughs> Well, well how do you describe, how do you, yeah. <laughs> it took a lot longer than, mostly, than, than oh. most films, but that it's also because I do live in Paris and uh, it wasn't convenient for me to spend all my time as you normally would in such a documentary. So also, as I said, <coughs> the film started out being an abécédaire and uh, was with my little camera and uh, there probably wouldn't have been so much of my footage in the major film which was supposed to be shot in HD if Phyllis hadn't gotten really sick and had a mm. laryngitis, it simply wouldn't heal. But now I'm happy, you know, that that is, although the film, as you can see, everything has been stretched out, so that sometimes the proportions are a little bit awkward because they took a small DVD footage and s stretched yes. it out to, uh, to yeah. HD, so things are somehow out of proportion. What's proportions. HD? High, High definition, definition, which oh, okay. is you the have the to wider know screen, the wider yeah. screen. But I don't, this is only my own quirkiness, but I worked very, very hard on, and nobody's ever mentioned this, but I will mention it myself, that uh, we work with HD uh, professional uh, footage. My camera was um, the small DVD, but still in 4.3 footage, and hmm. I tried very hard to, to make different uh, aspect formats ratios. and aspects, yeah, yeah. so that there are actually three aspects in it where she's watching her own home movie and a 4-3 uh, There's that was my own movie that I did for my father's birthday. And that was yeah. part of it. And uh, and then we have the HD and we have the anyway. It took a lot of time and that took a lot of money because we did have to spend a week making those frames. And I always hope that somebody in the audience will say, hey, you know, but nobody <laughs> ever does. <laughs> nobody ever does. So. Maybe the next time I won't work so hard on the aesthetic <laughs> aspects of this film, but that did take a long time. Yeah. Mies yeah, always yeah. said, you know, it's the things that nobody notices. Exactly. The <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The detail. I, I no, no, not the details. It's just the stuff that people don't notice. You know, it, when, when, when we're doing secret building, and first of all, there wasn't a granite um, sidewalk. Nobody was doing that. But instead of a steel curb, he made a, uh, a um, granite. Mm. And somebody said, well, nobody will notice that. And he said, yes, that's just the point. <laughs> yeah, amazing. The, the home movies are, are quite amazing record of the early portion of your life. And I'm wondering if there's, yeah, I'm thinking particularly of, of the photographic record of Seagram as it's going up. Are there, is there a kind of filmic archive of that also? Were you, were you ever shooting? Yes, we did. Uh, we did. Uh, we, we started one with Envar Rodokievitz. Huh. And Ricky Leacock as a cameraman, and somehow they just never got finished. Yeah, but Do is that footage from that? I think they were just pl pl pour pouring the, um, the the bronze uh, sheets into. It. I think that's the only footage from that. No, because this is w this is a really an interesting archival point because yeah. that footage that uh, I worked into the um, my spoof of Citizen Kane and the News on the March. The whole, all the footage from the Seagrams. Okay, could you talk for a few minutes and I'll be right back. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Do it for me too. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, we got that footage from Seagrams, but it didn't have any labeling on it. And I asked Ricky Leacock, she said, Ricky, Rishi, that she thought that Ricky Leacock was the cameraman. And he lives around the corner from me in Paris. Huh. And I, she said, do you think I did that? And I said, I really wish you would tell me if you did, because I'd like to put your name you know, having Ricky Leacock's early footage on your own documentary is kind of, he said, but I'm really not sure. I'm really not sure. But she doesn't know either. Uh, nevertheless, huh. that footage didn't come, we didn't have to pay for that footage. So that's how we know that nobody signed it because that's one problem of documentaries is that you have to pay heavily 
for any kind of footage that you use that is not shot by yourself. Um, and so I think that is really fantastic footage and it, it worked perfectly well with the little medallions of the four architects. Every time I see the film now, I think that that is the weakness in a way of the film is that the mm. architects are so laudatory, you know, yeah. and, and it's so fantastic and it's so this and it's so that. Nobody makes any criticism of it. But in any case, uh, it, it, it did work well, for especially for um, the reminiscence that, um, that, Nick, uh, that Rick Scafidio had, where he actually remembered going being up. going up on the yeah, roof yeah. and we managed to be able to get those roof pictures as if he had shot them himself. So I do like that sequence for that. Did you find in the, in the collection itself, w are there films and moving images? I, I assumed almost all of them would have been within the collection at the CCA, what, you're, you're what, suggesting. What do you mean? The well, well the, Seagram, yeah. the Seagram's footage was, but otherwise uh, we, got, we got things from television and huh. uh, you know, of course, the, yeah. there, when there was te television coverage or as I say, newspapers and uh, the press. We had a wonderful documentary, doc, uh, researcher, you say, in English, you say documentariste in mm. French. She was quite wonderful. We spent a great deal of time um, in the arc, um, uh, planning the archives and looking through. You can't imagine the number of photographs that are in her own Phyllis Lambert archives, the photographs that she's taken of everything. Yeah. And uh, it, that, that is what was very, very time consuming, but which was also a lot of fun, which was also a lot of fun. And that's where I realized that in a way, there's a whole other part of her that she could really capitalize on, and that is her, pho her photography of architecture, because she did, has yeah. done, covered many, 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 many subjects. And at one point, when I was going to do the abecedaire, I was going to also you know, A for architect, but I was also going to go through all the countries and show, mm. you know, the, the, the photographs that she had made for the different uh, letters, if, if Rome, R for Rome, yeah. because she's covered everything. She's really, it's really a fantastic archive. And unfortunately, uh, the person who did not feed me the, the photographs that I wanted, meaning that I had to put in those rather boring photographs of the Parthenon, uh, he's the man who should really be doing this, but he's now into other things. So, voila. It's work to be done if any of you want to propose oh. yourself for <laughs> doing the Phyllis Archive photography and getting a grant for it. Now she's not here. I will <laughs> <laughs> suggest that you do this. Are there any questions here in the audience? We've talked so much, and it's always... Uh, Well, I really wish that we would have one hour on her film, on her life, which would be this film, and that then the National Film Board would kindly allow me to do another hour that would be totally devoted to the CCA and the collections, because mm. the collections are really fantastic, and I feel that I did not do them justice here. But this ended up being a television film and not a film produced by Phyllis Lambert or the CCA. Had it been we would have made a film on the CCA, her as a collector, and how, how a private collection became a institution and an institutional collection. And I think that that's a very interesting subject. But television today is not interested in subjects like that. I don't even think the BBC would be interested in that today. And if the BBC wouldn't give money for a subject like that, certainly Canadian television, who doesn't even realize hmm. what they <laughs> have in Montreal in the CCA was not willing to do that. And they actually helped me cut out a lot of the stuff that they thought was too, what would I say, too intellectual or too artistic or too, I don't know what the another word world. Another world. Another world that is not a television world. And so this is a compromise, mm -hmm. as all films are, it's a compromise. And I would have liked to have done a lot more in the CCA. And I would, and I started out by wanting to to be the colonel of, of the film, but it didn't. The producers were not in favor of that. D did the two of you in your conversations <laughs> think about uh, 
and discuss the idea of audience with, with the film? I mean, thinking then of, of who's commissioning Well, you must it. have been thinking about that. I wasn't. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I was just responding to Terry's... Uh, well, I'm just thinking of, the, of, of that topic in relation, in effect, to the birth of the archive. I mean, the great collection and the making of a kind of audience. No, it's not just a specialist curator, historian, but, but that it's a kind of public institution. Oh, well, the, uh, the CCA, that's the And the no audience question. of the CCA, I, I, in a way, the film is an extension of that project, of the building of audience and not just the collecting of well, material. Well, it is the CCA, I mean, it's major statement is uh, make architecture a public concern. Yeah. And you can't do that with um, on, on a um, kind of populist basis. You have to do it on a very serious basis that then, you know, well-researched basis that then moves forward, which is always much more interesting anyway, you know. Mm. And um, so the, the kind of things, you know, it's now 20 years since we opened the building to the public and it's fascinating looking back with our first exhibitions where uh, very much related to the sort of great objects in the collections. I mean, the, the photography and architecture, oh. and uh, it was that actually was creating a new subject, really. And nobody had ever focused on that as, a, as an idea. And then we, um, uh, you know, had exhibitions on the, the, the Barry Virgil's first exhibition was the um, Pantheon, symbol of revolution. You know, and that was a wonderful sort of museum museum kind of uh, exhibition. Then we did the Baldus with the uh, Museum of uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. But then we sort of said, well, okay, fine, but we want, you know, how do you make pub architecture a public concern? We did numerous exhibitions on Montreal, research that had never, never been hmm. done before. I, I did an exhibition in 1982, was it 82? 92, 92. On, um, on uh, 18th century, opening the gates of 18th century Montreal. None of that had ever been looked at, you know, really, and pulled together. So, and then, then we did on Mo uh, Montreal metro Metropolis, we did a thing on Vancouver. We did, you know, an exhibition on Peter Eisenman. Uh, but there were never, they, they, these were never, our interest was never, 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 never to do um, monographic studies on any, any mm. level, but it was always a certain problematic that, that, that came things and of course now recently since Mirko Zardini has been there what's that I think it's a scooter I see, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mirko uh, uh, did the first exhibition he did was out of the box and uh, he wasn't he wasn't the director at that point and then he's done all those fabulous exhibitions on the uh, uh, the um, census of, of the city and yeah. then 1973 out of gas and the that wonderful exhibition on uh, environments where he took uh, uh, you know, two, two very different type of positions. And again, he did that sort of thing with um, uh, some ideas about uh, living in London and Tokyo with uh, Stephen Taylor and, and uh, Peer. And uh, in, in uh, Tokyo, it's, it's, it was his name was Sanus, uh, one of the people from Sanus, mm. wonderful stuff. And then our new exhibition is on <laughs> actions, what you can do with the city. And, you know, this, so, so it focuses on, you know, uh, what planting, landscape, uh, uh, um, food, uh, walking, and uh, things. And that's the 99 examples from all over the world. I don't think there are a Asia, actually, but um, North America and, and Europe. And uh, that's a, that, that a really is, is a marvelous Exhibition. The next one is going to be Speed and Its Limits, which deals with, of course, this is coming up this year. It's the, um, I think it's what, the 100th anniversary of, um, <coughs> of the. The Futurist. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, uh, and, and these have been, uh, you know, really very strong ideas. And then we're doing an exhibition uh, in 2011 with Yale on. Um, on, on Jim Sterling, which is going to be t Tony Vidro's uh, curating that. It's going to be, yeah. you know, marvelous. So, you know, the, the, the kind of way of being able to look at architecture not as object but as idea. And that's really, we had a marvelous exhibition just recently called La Lumière Zenitale. I don't know how that's in, in English, but 
<laughs> it's skylights, but it's not, not, you know, not, not a banal uh, way of saying it. But, you know, from, from the 1760s when they, in Paris, when they, um, um, the, uh, the, uh, the um, you know, what is it called? The Haymarket, the... The Grand Palais? No, 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 the, no, no, no. The, um, no, it wasn't Les Arbes. It was much later. This hmm. is 1760. Oh, that's 1860. This was the um, very bare painting. The, 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 the great dome that uh, Brain was put under. Now, how long? Obre. Obre. And um, you know, th they needed to cover it to protect it, and they needed to get light in. And so, it really was much more of how 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 they were used <coughs> in terms of, of of you know functioning. For example, there were photographs from Chicago in the 19, early 20th century, of these tenements where the courtyard was there and they put light huh. to, to bring it in. So, and then of course the great railroad stations. And, well, you can imagine what kind of material was in there. It was absolutely fabulous material, but there wasn't any interest in that as a, you know, say the Trafalgarist and blah, blah, blah. But it was really um, kind of how these, you know, how uh, what these mean in, in the life of, of, of the time and, and the city, and uh, so that was a, that was a marvelous exhibition. Just to give you sort of an example of, you know, non-object kind of oriented things. Well, and of the city itself becoming increasingly a topic of the shows, oh yeah. certainly at the oh center. Yeah. I oh think yeah. uh, as that topic has emerged and become more prominent, I'm wondering if if you might say something to us about how the what you perceive of as the audience that you're that you're speaking to and working with might or might not have changed over the years. Now that, we, now that we're at 20 years with the center, I'm just curious. I think that we all changed. Yeah. You know, and I think the audience has changed. Not only, I mean, the Montreal the C CCA has been there all the time, and there's been lots of the other museums start showing architecture, you know, so yeah. that's, that's, that's great. But the, um, uh, I, I think that people have changed all, all, all over the world. I mean, I think the non-object position is not just the CCA, I mean, I think it's a very strong position yeah. on many levels, and the, the concern of the city and the terms of concern of landscape. Um, I think that uh, the, the idea of the um, census of the city was that the city is not just visual, as it always been, yeah. but there are all those extraordinary things of the sound and the smells and the surfaces and the seasons, those things that change it. But I think that the, actually, I guess our, our exhibitions, our earlier exhibitions, were, you know, very kind of magnificent, but, um, well, I guess, you know, the, the great exhibition we had was, the, the, uh, before the earlier, was the, the American one, that Liz Diller, yeah. uh, it was Georges Tesson's idea, but Liz Diller was the one who installed it in an absolutely brilliant way. And, you know, so that the whole question of law and landscape in, how, how that changes in terms of social, uh, 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 political, uh, architectural, uh, urban you know, issues. And um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was interested particularly in the audiences and how the, how the CCA, Although it comes up also with the film, how, how the idea of an audience might help shape your thinking about the, either the role of the institution. I'm particularly interested in, in, I guess, a more general question about architectural culture. Is it changing? How is it changing? Yes, it's changing. But I, mean I, think that I think you have to say that we don't s sit there yeah, and saying, what does exactly. the audience want to think? Exactly. You know, because I think that you're a place where you want to lead the thinking and not follow. But at the same time, we're part of the world, and the world is has changed its positions, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I think everybody, everybody, uh, one of the big changes everywhere is the interest in contemporary, hmm. you know, uh, uh, not the historical, the contemporary. Now, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but I think it's very important that the issues of the time be, be, be uh, you know, presented. And um, the audience, you know, we have gained a greater and greater audience and mostly young people. I mean, our, our, hmm. our, we're, we're interested in people from, you know, like little kids to, uh, you know, young, young architects and uh, 14 to uh, 37 or 34 or 5 or some, something like that. And that's, uh, that's a terrific audience, you know.
I mean, we don't have all those silly ladies that go to Museum of Fine Arts and things like that. <laughs> Can we open it to questions on the floor? Does anyone? Is the CCA running out of space? Pardon? Is the CCA running out of space? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, well, I'll tell you one of the things we were doing. No, no, we're not running out of space. We are um, actually, where other people are building bits of buildings that aren't exactly building, we're building a fantastic um, website. We have a pretty good website now, but it's just a good website. But we're really doing one that's going to make our uh, collections much more accessible and ideas. I mean, we, we're on Facebook, we're on you know, you, YouTube and all that sort of stuff. Is, uh, is that changing your idea of, of collecting, of what to collect? Well, I think we're, we're about, yes, it's a very good question. We're, we're at the point now of saying, okay, library. You know, what, what is it? It's, you know, always the thing from the past, but the contemporary uh, thing, what is that? What photography? That's changed radically from the time we started. Radically, mm. you know, 30 years ago. And um, I, I guess those are the two major issues. And of course, there is also a very interesting problem. We, we work a lot with other universities. For example, uh, when we did Out of the Box, uh, Columbia took both the head center price section of it and then also the uh, Gordon Anna Clark section on two different uh, exhibitions. And we've worked with MIT students uh, on the hall building and, you know, so, so that it, it's just a very good kind of interchange. But uh, I was taking myself away from my point. You, you said how had the... Your, your idea of collecting. Yeah, yeah. With the different subgroups. Well, yeah. of course, the, the architectural thing is the real problem is what to do about, um, uh, uh, you know, material on, on computer, on um, how do, what's the general work <coughs> information technology? Because, as you know, nobody knows how long any of this stuff will last and be available. And then also, there's all that very interesting kind of work that's being done by Greg Lynn and all of this, where it's the machine itself that is generating much of the uh, information and, and the, uh, the ideas. And so we are, we, we, we work closely with the universities on that. We'll, we'll have a curator who is a, um, arch uh, a uh, information technology archivist, but we will work with, um, you know, s some of the universities in Montreal and other places in terms of you know, how, the, how, how, how one can deal with this material. Montreal is a pretty interesting um, group of people at the University of the Quebec and Montreal and Concordia University. They formed something called Hexagon. They have various stu studios about dealing with this, uh, various aspects of that. So, you know, this is something um, we could work with people. I mean, we're working now with um, uh, HIHA. Um, in, in, in Zurich, and um, you know, we'll sort of spread that, but we'll, we'll see how that, that, that but it's, it's a problem to, to really be dealt with. Mm. When Peter Eisenman uh, says at the end of the film that you will go down in history for uh, what you are collecting of the 50s and 60s, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, that's pretty good stuff. <laughs> um, we started collecting I guess Peter's work quite a long time ago. And um, he did that one publication on... Um, uh, uh but what do you mean by his work? It's not really his work that you're collecting. They're archives, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's, that's the, the work. Yeah. No, but I mean... The yes, yeah, so we'll go, okay, <coughs> let's, let's go back to the archive. That's very good. Because we've never, never, never been interested in the one drawing that represents a building. Mm. As uh, Photographs are different, but even so, we like photographs that move around the building. But uh, or that, that, that are somehow development of an idea rather than just, you know, object. An object. And uh, in the archives, uh, we, we have, um, you know, all of the documentation pertaining to the work of an architect, uh, architect over time or a project over time. And uh, this was something, well, John Harris and I were very interested in back in the, about 30 years ago. And um, so we've always collected in that way in depth in, in cer certain areas. 
and um, so that it's it's the ideas the the ideas the, 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 the I don't know if you saw that little exhibition of Corbusier at the Riva, uh, but uh, you know there's some of those wonderful little idea drawings from our collection uh, there, and um, I mean these are these are the kind of marvelous things, but also you know those kind of working drawings and the problems that come up, the change over time in a project. I mean, those are all very fascinating things. So that, yes, we collected Peter, John Haydock, um, Cedric, uh, Cedric. Cedric uh, Jim Sterling, uh, Aldo Rossi. <coughs> and you begin to see how very much they are certain problems that we're all dealing with, you know, after, after a while. And what, what is interesting also is that you know, it's not one archive or something like that, but all these things cross over each other. It cross over the, um, you know, I mean, if you if you have a piece of material there and you're looking <coughs> at them, then something else ha starts to happen. But is each item in each, um, in, in let's say the Aldo Rossi collection yeah. where there's a whole wall of red um, dossier, you know, the red, that's all Aldo Rossi's office that's there at the CCA in Montreal in the basement. Uh, so the basement is the vaults. <laughs> Sorry, it's called a cage. <laughs> you saw that in no. the film. It's definitely a vault. And um, very carefully controlled in terms of uh, climate. And but, I mean, does it th nobody can get at that stuff unless it's all, each one of those drawings is really co is, is, is scanned and put... Well, that's what we're, we're going is to that be doing. You, is that what you're going to be yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah, but we're not doing every one of them because you cannot... You know, it's just huge. So what you do is you do a project on a project basis, and uh, which is really how uh, archives themselves document the material they do. And then, as a, as a person wants to come in and work on it, then they get into the individual uh, drawings and catalog that on, on on a deeper level. So if somebody wanted to do a thesis on Aldo Rossi, they'd have to come to Montreal. Oh uh, yes, yes, they? yes, of course. Yeah. So I mean, that's it's. But but then but the whole spread of the material because it's not just Aldo Rossi the drawings and uh, things but there's also of course the books on the magazine we have a very uh, uh, strong collection mm. of journals which so many libraries took and and and, uh, di and, and made on what is it called uh, microfiche microfiche yeah. and is they lose all the advertising all that delicious stuff yeah. that sort of has. Uh, gives context of the, the time. And we have a lot of, you know, ephemeral kind of stuff, like the um, um, advertising in uh, architectural journals and those sort of things. And it's, it's marvelous uh, material. To lots of that came into uh, sense of the city, certainly in lighting, you know. Hmm. Th there's always a question around collecting that has to do with how one draws the limits. D do, do you, yeah, I, I'm yeah. curious with, with the world like Mises, which kind of goes in endless numbers of directions through advertising, through the company's products that are coming in, wh where do you draw the line in terms of collecting material around a figure or a project? Is there any aspect of Seagram well, that okay, might have been... For un Mises, sorry? Is there any aspect of the work that, that might cross the line, become uninteresting in terms of it, its relation to architecture or the discipline? Well, we very consciously collected the people around me, Peter Carter, mm, mm. Uh, Myron Goldsmith, uh, uh, other people who, who, who worked with in Macy's office. And so that gives a whole you know, view of the uh, field and then the um, the more ephemeral material, I guess, one gets through the to, to the journals yeah. and um, uh, articles and stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, may, maybe I missed your point. No, I'm just wondering if there uh, if there are collections of the way that the building might appear in Hollywood films over the years, or yeah, I yeah, mean, all of the kind yeah, of yeah, secondary. Yeah, kind of stuff. Sure, 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 sure. We have s collected some of that, not others. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's fun. Questions? Comments? Observations? <laughs> Comments? End of film? <laughs> yeah. Reviews? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm thinking of something interesting to say. <laughs> ah, great.
different, different in the competition for the design of cities? Yeah. Yes, yes. The west side competition. Yes, yes. And whether that's something that... Pardon, uh, what, what is your question? Uh, whether that's... Well, what, what made you initiate that competition? Why, why did I do that? Why did you do it? Well, I think that there <coughs> is a you need to explain what it is. question about... The, well, okay. Thank you. Uh, I decided to do a series of, that was the only one I did, because it was mon mon in order to, to raise money to do things like that. Other cities, it's not so obvious. And um, the idea was that, you know, the question of the city is a hugely uh, problematic question. And as you know, departments of city planning, uh, you know, rose in the uh, 50s and got, you know, died in the 90s. And the question was, uh, you know, how, how can one, wh what is the kind of, what do you do in a, in, in a city? In New York, we took the lower, well, the, the, the whole area that's sort of very neglected, where the trains come in from New Jersey, and this very big open <coughs> gap, gap there. And um, so that we had that competition to, uh, <coughs> you know, see what the ideas are, how, how one could make, you know, it, it was an opportunity to take the whole area and make something of it rather than again this terrible real estate chunking down everything into parcels that uh, un uncoordinated. You know, New York doesn't do that. They never do. do. And so I thought it was, it was very important in that time. And quite a few things are coming out of that. For example, the High Line that Rick Scavidio just happens, uh, Scavidio, uh, Scavidio and, and Illich uh, won, won the competition. But that High Line first came into kind of new again when we were doing that and, and um, then also this, you know, it comes up again and again what to do with the rail lines because there's a big ga gap in, in, in the city and uh, these are fantastic opportunities but uh, the, what, that's one of the things I love in Montreal is that we do whole chunks of the city. For example, there's something called the Quartier International de Montréal and it's about a thousand feet long and it takes in a, 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 uh, an extension to the, uh, what is it called, the, where you show uh, cars and all that sort of stuff, uh, convention hall. And then uh, it covers a, a, a what was a open cut in the city that had been made in the 60s. We're all repairing all these horrible things in the 60s that were done. And um, the, 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 then it was covered over. And then the great square called uh, Square Riappel because there's a sculpture of Riappel. And there's a marvelous building uh, that creates on the ground uh, where you could go up a uh, uh, level. And it's a, between two gardens, two, two squares. And it's a, it's a fantastic sort of thing. So these kind of things, and this happens because people all around uh, were, you know, one architect, René Daoud, thought of the idea. Uh, it had been in the air, but she was the one who brought it to the largest landowner in the area and said, you know, what about if we do this? And he said, sure, great. This was the case of the Bois de Placement. And said, okay, this is swell if we can get other people to agree to uh, around, to, or enthusiastic about it. Of course, everybody else was enthusiastic. And so that's happening again in another area called the Quartier des Spectacles. And then it's also happening near around where the CCA is. A wonderful area with lots of uh, really fantastically good uh, um, um, buildings from the 19th century and 18th to 17th century. There's the earliest towers of, of stone that were made there, but with great gardens <coughs> around Quartier des Jardins. And so, you know, this is the way that, that's happening. And the whole process of public, uh, public consultation, I think this is really very important. Does that answer your question? I go off on track. I'm interested in this. <laughs> uh, what did you say? How can you decide what? For the competition. Who to invite uh, for the competition? Oh, oh well. The short list, I guess. The ever so, okay? <laughs> ever so. We always have to decide. Like that. We tried to get Rem on that one, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't work on it. But. Uh, so who was, who did work on it? Peter Eisenman. Um, 
Oh, that guy, he won the Pritzker Prize from, I don't like his very so much, Los Angeles. Um, what was his name? Tommy. Oh, Tommy, Tommy, yeah. Tommy. Um, his UN studio, I think. UN, no, it was UN, yes, UN yeah, studio. UN studio, Jesse and then, and, and then the young uh, uh, office from New York of. Or, yeah. Yeah. Jesse Reiser. So w w how we did it? Well, we just looked at who was doing stuff that was interested in this kind of working in the city. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ralph Lerner was kind of the uh, professional advisor on the project. And, and, you know, a lot of us talked about who, who should be in it. What was the phrase that was it? Was it in the film or in the introduction before? Could have, could have and should have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who could have, who should have. Yeah. I'll save that at the end of it. Who, those who could and shouldn't. Those who should and couldn't, yeah. and those who could and should. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Phyllis, thank you very much for the evening. Terry, you too. Thank you both for coming in and showing us. The evening wouldn't be here. If we it look forward for Terry. to Citizen Citizen Lambert too when it comes out, and you'll show that here also. Please, thank you very much. <laughs>